We are so excited to host this pop-up event here for Glendale Tech Week. Today, we're gonna learn about artificial intelligence. We have this amazing company right here in Glendale, Beyond Limits. They have a wonderful presentation and a panel today, so I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Diane Zuckerman, give her a hand. Thank you. We are so pleased to be here and honored, and thank you so much for the turnout. We're excited. Um, artificial intelligence, it's a really bad name, because there's nothing artificial about it. But what we're gonna talk about today is about our company, Beyond Limits, um, a startup very close to here, where we came from, what we do, and hopefully engage you guys to um, think about this for maybe your future. Okay, we're gonna take questions at the very end. I'm gonna jump up on stage and give you a little bit of background on who we are and then introduce the true experts over here, which are our um, data science team and our software engineers. So let me get started. Can you guys see this? Can you see what it is? It's a robot, right? Okay. So our company, Beyond Limits, we are very near here because we emanated from the Jet Propulsion Lab, Caltech, and NASA. You guys familiar with that? How many have heard of any of those? Ah, bunches. Awesome. Great. Lots of you. Um, our mission is to create products that scale, that scale to solve very, very difficult, complex, and mission critical problems. Hence, I'm showing this robot up here, which is a Mars rover, which was sent to Mars. It's an unmanned spacecraft, has lots of, lots of parts and sensors and rules to it, and is going to first one, going to a place we'd never been with lots and lots of unknowns. And that's why we talk about the very difficult and complex problems we solve. And it takes pretty robust AI to do that. Anybody here familiar with or heard of machine learning? Great, like finding cats and dogs, right? How about uh, deep learning? AlphaGo, awesome. Um, natural language processing. Anybody use Siri or Alexa? There you go. So that's natural language processing. Um, neural nets. Ever heard of a neural net? I know it gets, wow, we got one really smart one back here. Okay, it's heard of everything. Well, we're going to get, the, we're going to get into all of that. Because in the definition of AI, which the really experts will talk about over here, it consists of all those things. There is not one, as many people as in this room, there'd be that many definitions of, of artificial intelligence and AI. So with that said, I'd like to bring the panel up and we'll get started with the software engineers first and then our data scientists. Come on up, guys. Um, <laughs> is anybody, uh, if you're familiar with software engineers, um, think about Netflix. You guys use Netflix? Yes. Yeah. OK. So on Netflix, um, when you think about how it works and what it looks like, OK, that's what the software engineers do. They make it work in the back, and they make it really pretty and friendly in the front, OK? But when you get recommendations of what's the movie, the next movie you want to see, or you watch Strange Things, so let me see what uh, they would recommend, that's where the data scientists come in and do the recommendations and do the research in the back end stuff. So why don't we start with Laura, our software engineer over here. Hi, guys. <laughs> oh, so lively, I like it. Okay, so like Diane said, my name's Laura and I'm on the software engineering team over at Beyond Limits. So uh, I don't know if you guys know, but you can also break software engineering down into a whole bunch of different subsections. What I do at Beyond Limits is front-end software engineering. 
And if you don't know what that is, front end is basically anything that you would interact with when you use a computer, your phone, when you're playing on an app, or when you're using Netflix, for example. The front end is the way that like, information is laid out on a screen, how pretty it is, what colors the page has, you know, what the overall composition of the visual elements are. So that's basically what front end people, front end engineers do uh, across the world. Here at Beyond Limits, for the front end, my role as a front end engineer means that I just help take the data given to me by the data science team and the back end engineering team, and I just display it for any potential user in a really nice and easy to understand format. And I guess going back to our Netflix example, I saw that a lot of you guys have used Netflix before. And I guess if you think about front end in terms of Netflix, front end is how the pictures show up on your front Netflix page or when you scroll down, all the loading images that happen, all the different things that you can click around with. The front end is basically what things look like, but the back end is basically how things work. And for more information on the back end, I'll just hand it over to my friends Uche and Trey over here. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Uche Akatobi, graduated from the University of Southern California with a degree in computer engineering, computer science. Yeah, go USC. <laughs> I am a back-end software engineer. I've been doing programming in one form or another for about 30-something years now. But back-end software engineering, front-end is the part that you see. Back-end is the part that you don't. You guys use Google every day. The part of the Google web page that's actually in your browser is the front-end. The part that runs on Google servers inside Google's data centers, that's us. That's the sort of thing that we write. And when it comes to something like Netflix, for instance, whenever you hit search in Netflix, your front end request goes to us. Over on the back end, we start gathering data from the database, from data scientists, from ever, wherever we need to. And then we collate that information, send it back to the front end, and that goes to your eyes to see. And that all happens within a fraction of a second. For Beyond Limits specifically, a lot of the work that we do is with visualization because we deal with numbers. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of numbers. And the best way to show those numbers is not with a giant spreadsheet, of course. It's with charts and graphs, you know, pie graphs, scatter plots, that sort of thing. And so a lot of that work, front end asks, hey, can I have the numbers necessary to do this nice visualization that comes to us, we gather the information, they crunch the numbers, and then we send that back up. Shreya also works in the back end, and she can tell you more about some of the work that we do. Thank you, Uche. And like you mentioned, I'm Shreya. I'm also a back end software engineer at Beyond Limits. Did my master's in computer science from USC. I could see some fight on there, but yes. And uh, primarily, like he's talking about Netflix. So just to add a few more backend components to Netflix, you have a certain ID, password to log in and log out of your system that ensures security of your application. It ensures that only you are able to access the features that you actually want to see. Who does that? The backend engineers are actually supposed to work on the authentication, authorization, and all those big words that you keep hearing. Or for example, you're watching Friends or The Office on Netflix or any series for that matter. See, I see the Friends guy there. <laughs> so when you log in, you are watching, say, for example, season three, episode five. The next time you log in, does it ask you to start over or does it just resume playing from where you stopped? Who does that? Backend engineer. And of course, we then transmit the information to the front end people so that they can actually show things like, you know, season three, episode two, now playing. Play, pause, rewind, forward, and those kind of things. And my job here at Beyond Limits is pretty similar. I interact with front end engineers and the data scientists, collaborate with them, do some visualization so that the subject matter expertise. People don't have to actually look through numbers and spreadsheets, as you mentioned. You can just see everything pictographically represented and understand everything. And what do we need to do all this? Data. Like you said, lots and lots of data. And then we give it to the data scientists, and they do their little magic. 
So that's a quick overview of uh, software engineers, what they do. So I think you get the idea. Front end, it looks pretty. Back end, it works. Now we're going to hear from the data scientist and where all that data comes from. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Nicole, and I'm a data scientist here at Beyond Limits. But my background is actually in chemical engineering. So I did both my undergrad and my master's degree in chemical engineering. And in grad school, I got exposed to data science as a way to analyze my experimental results a little bit better, like another set of tools to look at my data in a new light. Um, so that's how I ended up here at Beyond Limits as a data scientist, and I'm fairly new to the field, but it's been great so far. Uh, so what does a data scientist actually do? So like Shreya was mentioning, Netflix is gathering, to use Netflix as an example, it's gathering all of this data on what shows you've watched, what shows other people like you have watched, what shows you watched around this time last year, what show you're halfway through, all of this. And then it's taking all those inputs, and then have you ever seen the, um, the percent match in Netflix for certain shows? Has anyone seen that? Yeah. yeah, so that's a data scientist designing an algorithm, or more likely a group of data scientists that's designed an algorithm to take all of those inputs, all of that data that they've collected on their users, and come up with a recommendation per, or a match percent, and come up with those recommendations for what shows you might want to watch next. Um, so that's using something called an algorithm, where you're taking a bunch of inputs, aka your data and other people's data, and then coming up with what shows you might want to watch next. Um, so I'll pass it off to Giovanni to talk a little bit more about what we do at Beyond Limits as data scientists, or what data scientists do in general. Great. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Giovanni. I uh, uh, first, um, you know, as a kid, got really excited about trying to understand how the external world works, right? So, well, what's the best way to do that is uh, let's go to school and study physics, right? That teaches you how to understand how the external world works and operates, right? Then I thought, well, what about our own internal world, right? How does our brain work? And then, you know, I said, well, what's the best way to do that? Well, I went to grad school and I studied neuroscience, which is, you know, the science of understanding how the human brain works. And at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, how is this related to what we do as data scientists and how do we help beyond limits with our work as data scientists? Well, the mission uh, of us data scientists is to try to help people and companies make better decisions, right? In order to do that, we need to empower people and companies with the tools to understand the data, understand how the uh, external world works and understand how our human brains process that information and help us make decisions. And what we do as a company is take somebody's problem and we specialize in problems that are very difficult to understand, very complex to solve. They require a lot of data and a lot of understanding of that data. And we process it and together with our friends and colleagues, software engineers, we develop products whose primary goals and objectives is to help make better decisions, right? And I want you to get very excited about the fact that helping people and companies make better decisions really applies everywhere around where you look. And so if you ever decide to try to understand how to help people make better decisions in the future, think about this. You go to the doctor's office, the doctor has to decide whether to prescribe a certain treatment over another. You as a data scientist can help the doctor make a better informed decision. Uh, if you're a Lakers fan or a Dodgers fan uh, and you want to help the coach make better decisions as to how, strategi how to strategize for a certain game, well, you as a data scientist can help with understanding the data on the problem and help deliver something that will empower the coach to make better decisions. So what we do as data scientists at Beyond Limits is that we take somebody's problem, we break it down, we understand its core, we understand what the company needs in order to make a better decision, and we develop a product that will help them do that. And as a data scientist, I feel like our mission has very broad and very direct implications, right? Making better decisions is what's going to help us uh, turn our uh, industries into more efficient and more environmentally friendly industries. It's what's going to help doctors make better decisions. It's what's going to help sport coaches make better decisions. So we as data scientists really empower ourselves and help empower others with the ability to make better decisions. And that's sort of the, the message that I want you to go home with. Uh, and, and really consider it as, as a future opportunity for, for what you'd want to do with 
uh, with your own futures. So we've talked a lot about the technology side, okay, which is highly important. But what's really important is what you do with this technology. And as Giovanni said, part of our mission is to improve the lives of individuals, of organizations and businesses, and of society as a whole. So don't think of it just as technology, but what you can do with that to make life better for everyone. So as a company, Beyond Limits, like, like anyone, you know, has to grow up and figure out what they want to do. And what we determined was, because we came from outer space and landing on Mars and running the Deep Space Network, where there's lots and lots of unknowns. First time we went to Mars, we didn't know what was really on Mars. I mean, you know certain things, but, but you uh, certainly don't know everything. Um, we said, what else is applicable to that that's important in the world? And we turned to subsurface. So instead of outer space, underground. And started looking at the energy area. Um, and there's lots of different lots of different energy. And obviously, I'm sure you guys are all aware that we're trying to get out of fossil fuels and we're trying to have you know, a lower carbon footprint and, and have a, a cleaner environment. Um, and that's where we're focusing right now as a major application in all kinds of different areas in, uh, in energy, into renewables and solar um, and hydro and geothermal and lots of areas for you guys whole new areas for you guys to be able to, to, uh, to master and get into. Um, as also mentioned, healthcare. Healthcare is extraordinarily important. So much data is necessary. There is n no one has the c capacity um, to, to store all that knowledge, okay? And that's where we really come into play in what we do in artificial intelligence that is, is different than what we spoke of earlier of machine learning and deep learning and um, natural language processing. And I'd like you guys to talk a little bit about what we do um, that's different and hence our names Beyond Limits because it's beyond the limit of what we would consider conventional AI or the machine learning, deep learning. Yeah, so maybe we'll just start with something that's a little more like the conventional AI. So there's many different types of AI, and one of the most common types of AI is numeric AI or machine learning. Uh, so a couple of you guys had heard of machine learning before? Yeah? So machine learning is um, it's pretty common nowadays, but it's pretty much teaching or training a program through exposure to a huge amount of data. So. Um, essentially, the program is learning through experience as it goes through all of this data that it's seeing. So one example uh, might be if you want to teach a computer to classify between apples and oranges. So you might gather 100 different apples and oranges, and for each fruit, you would write down certain features of each fruit, like what color it is, what shape it is, what texture it is, things like that. And then you might give all of that data to the computer, to the program, and allow the program to make inferences about that data on its own. So before telling the computer, you don't tell the computer anything about, or you don't tell the program anything about apples or oranges. It has no prior knowledge that apples are red or oranges are orange, or that they're both round or that oranges are bumpy and apples are smooth. But it goes through the data, and as it goes through and sees more and more cases of, okay, apples tend to be red and oranges tend to be orange, it learns based off of those features whether to classify it as an apple or an orange. So that's a very simple explanation of machine learning, but in essence, it's uh, taking all of this data and allowing the computer to come to its own conclusions and recognize patterns kind of on its own. Um, so you don't give the computer any prior knowledge about uh, the data or the task that it's trying to complete. Uh, Giovanni, do you want to talk a little bit more about numeric yeah. AI and machine learning? So I want to go back. Symbolic too. Right. So I want to go back to uh, what Diane just said. What you know? Why is Beyond Limits called Beyond Limits? Right. So what Nicole just described is what we refer to as the world of conventional artificial intelligence. And conventional is by no means a, you know, a, a way to sort of you know, uh, undersize the amount of growth and, and development in that area. Right? If you think about all the amazing technology that has become available to us just within the last five or ten years, a lot of that is because of our work uh, or everybody's work in, in machine learning and artificial intelligence. But going back to our mission of 
how do we really ensure that our work will help people make better decisions? Well, the way we think about it is with the analogy of what we refer to as a black box, right? With the explosion of data and the really complex algorithms or the, the math that we use in order to understand how that data helps us distinguish apples from oranges or my face from your face or any other of the uh, amazing applications of machine learning, um, we humans don't really understand what happens inside that black box, right? The math gets so complicated that it would take 50 years for any one of us to really go and understand what has happened inside that black box. So what we need to do as a company, what any company really trying to empower people with artificial intelligence needs to do is open up that black box, right? And really show people what's inside so that when a doctor needs to decide between medication A or medication B, the doctor won't do it just because the machine said so, right? Imagine yourself as a doctor, you don't want to just change your behavior from one day to the next just because a computer told you that. Right? Imagine you're running the Los Angeles Lakers, right? And now a machine comes in and says, well, I think you should play these five guys. Well, you don't want to do it just because the machine told you so, right? So we want to go beyond conventional artificial intelligence and empower users with not only the really amazing value and insights and information that you can extract from the data, but also empower them with their own knowledge, their own experience, everything they've accumulated over a lifetime of acquiring knowledge and experience, as well as the knowledge and experience that all of their peers have accumulated. So how do we go about marrying these two worlds, right? On one hand, you have the world of machine learning. You have a ton of data. We produce more data in a day than we have for centuries. Right? How do we use that together with all the experience, with all the intuition, with all the knowledge that we humans accumulate uh, through our interactions with the environment and one another? And that's where um, our colleagues at Beyond Limits come in and, and sort of help us marry the, the two worlds and, and make a product that is more than the sum of its parts, right? And will really help whoever's using it make better decisions. Right? And also helping them open up that black box and peer inside and see what we've done in a way that resonates with their own experience and understanding of the problem. And that is the trick to make sure that people trust artificial intelligence and use it in their day-to-day -day life and every time they make a critical decision. So I'll pass it over to uh, Laura who will continue on, on this track and tell you a little bit more about about this. Yeah, Laura, maybe you want to talk about transparency and the importance of transparency and being able to see why a decision as an output is given? Yeah, for sure. So building off of what Giovanni and Nicole so wonderfully talked about, you know, I like that Giovanni in, at the end there went into, you know, the more human reasons why we incorporate these artificial intelligence technologies into the products we build as a company. Our goal incorporating these AI technologies is not to, you know, take over the world, you know, we don't want to program robots to completely wipe out the human race, we don't want to, like, do anything crazy like that. We just, yeah, trust us, we promise, we promise. But what we do want to do is give people the, I guess, the know-how to be able to look at the things that they do in their day-to-day -day lives, what do they do at their jobs, what can, what can they do, to make their jobs easier, you know? How can they make their lives more efficient? How can they maximize like their profits or maximize their potential or do what they like doing better? And I guess that's like the more humanitarian way that we like to think about our products here at Beyond Limits. And going back to AI in general, so we just heard Giovanni and Nicole talk about numeric AI, which some of you guys know as machine learning. And that's only one of the very many different kinds of AI. So keep, bear with me, this one's actually a little cool. <laughs> I'm gonna talk a little bit about symbolic AI. So symbolic AI is a little bit older. It's one of the older types of artificial intelligence. It's been in the industry for a long time. And so if you can consider machine learning to be training a, training a system or a machine or a computer based on a whole bunch of data, data upon data upon data, if it's if that's how you train your computer to learn by practice, symbolic AI is kind of giving it the education it needs to use knowledge over training. 
And let me try to think about how to make that a little simpler to understand here. So if you want to teach your computer using symbolic AI methodology, you would, instead of giving it large amounts of data, you would give it higher level abstract concepts to think about. You would tell it like logic or you would teach it, uh, you know, different education, different knowledges, and allow it to build a base of knowledge in the back end. So that way it can make decisions without needing all that other input data. Because sometimes, you know, you don't have a thousand images of apples and oranges. Like sometimes you just don't have this much stuff. So what happens if you look at, for example, you know, to build off of the apples and oranges, say your computer has a picture of a molding fruit, like, you know, like a gross moldy orange or squishy apple or something, something gross. And you need your computer to know that this is a moldy piece of fruit. You don't want to eat it. You don't want to put it wherever you're putting all the rest of the healthy fruit. So if you don't have a thousand pictures of moldy fruit, you need to instead give your computer the, like, the rules that it needs to make that guess on its own. So instead of giving it a thousand pictures of moldy fruit, you would instead describe to it what a moldy fruit looks like. Or you describe to it things that you wouldn't want in your food. So if it's gray, if it's squishy, if this is its texture, yada, yada, yada. You don't have to tell it this is what a moldy fruit is, but you can give it all these things, all these like, details, and then let it decide for itself. Now that's symbolic AI. I think that's pretty cool too. Yeah, just playing off of that a little bit of, of the symbolic side, think about how you make decisions every day. You reason, right? You go, oh, maybe a little of this, maybe a little of that. Let me take some data into to account, but you also have your biases, your intuition, what you like. So all of that is about reasoning. And when you have what's called a reasoning engine, so I'll give you just an example from this rover. So the rover obviously had to land, you know, safely on Mars, but it, the, the, the purpose wasn't just to land it. It was to be there, stay healthy, and um, get lots of, collect lots and lots of, of information so we'd know more about Mars, okay? And to stay healthy, it had to be powered. And the way it was powered was by solar panels. And to get enough solar, these panels opened up and closed, okay? Why did they open and close? They opened because they needed to have more light to get enough battery power, but they closed when um, something dirty or something uh, could influence their uh, ability to, to stay open and to harm the rover itself. Um, so what the rover ended up doing was realizing that there was a huge sand problem on Mars and all these sanding effects, uh, sandstorms. So it taught itself actually when to open and when to close so that it would stay healthy. That was not its primary purpose, but its primary purpose was to stay there and stay healthy and, uh, and, and to bring back, collect and send back information. But it didn't <coughs> know about the weather pattern. It was educated on its own and did that by reasoning, okay? That's the symbolic side, um, and kept itself healthy. I think it was supposed to, uh, I never remember these numbers, but it was supposed to last like, what was it, like six months and it lasted like four years or something. I mean, it was just incredible how, uh, how healthy it was able to, to stay and remain on its own. And that's uh, <coughs> where the symbolic side and the reasoning comes in which is separate but integrated or combined with the numeric and the machine learning. Hope that wasn't too out there for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so. Do, we, do you guys want to do some questions or you want to uh, oh, a little bit more? We actually have a little bit more to yeah, talk about here. About oh, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. So, yeah. so building off of what Laura said and Giovanni and Nicole said, here at Beyond Limits, we believe in a hybrid approach. We have the cognitive side, which actually takes in both symbolic and numeric AI. And there's no fixed recipe to it, like, you know, oh, 30% of this, 70% of that. It's based exactly on what kind of problem is presented in front of you. Like, on a daily basis, you might be seeing the apples and oranges, you might be seeing the moldy apple or whatever. You, through your experiences and your past knowledge, would be able to take a decision as to how much numeric side and symbolic side is involved. And I'm pretty sure Uche can add to that. Sure. I mean, it's fairly easy if you've got, say, 
a thousand pictures of moldy apples to figure out is the next picture of an apple moldy? That's numeric. Or say, if you have a stove and the stove is on, you put your hand on it, okay, your hand is burning now and that hurts. Heat plus active stove plus hand equals pain. Avoid pain, which means avoid one of those three things. That's symbolic. All right, easy peasy. Now what happens when you have, say, I don't know, a, an MRI of a cancerous tumor? Yeah, I guess you could go numeric, try to recognize cancerous tumors, but a doctor does more than that, right? A doctor also cares about the patient's medical history, their family's medical history. That's symbolic. Sometimes, to solve the hardest problems, you need a little bit from column A and a little bit from column B and whatever other information and techniques you can muster. And so that's what our company specializes in. Call it cognitive AI, but it's mix and match of whatever we need to solve some of the hardest problems that are out there. We have a slide of this, of the ball. Okay. Okay. So this is another this is another example of of uh, cognitive AI, uh, symbolic AI. Okay. Um, you've got a self-driving car, right? And a ball rolls across the street. The car sees an image, stops, and then proceeds. Okay. We know that that ball didn't come from outer space. That ball got there somehow. Likely, one of you guys kicked it there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and might be running after the ball to go get it. That car should not proceed. That's where the, the, the cognitive or the symbolic side comes in that says, reasons and says, ah, that ball didn't just fly out of you know, nowhere. It got there from some human, likely, um, kicking it. Okay. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. yeah. Great. What, um, do you want to take questions, guys? Yeah. yeah. Would you like sure. to in, yeah. ask our software engineers or our data scientists some questions? Yeah. Okay. So we can have one on each side. Yeah. Come on, you guys. I'm sure you've got questions. She has a question. Maybe our explanation oh, was so hard. Hands. Oh, oh yeah. Have you ever thought of sending anything to Jupiter? Mm -hmm. I suppose I could answer it. All right. So while our technology has been used in space, we are not currently working on a space mission at this time. That might change later. However, that being said, NASA just ended a mission to Jupiter not too long ago. And I believe NASA does have future plans to make future efforts in exploring some of Jupiter's moons, especially Europa. So there's going to be more in this space eventually. Um, uh, is the drone still a... Is it still in Mars? The, the drone? Oh, As in yeah. that thing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we have Spirit and Opportunity, I think the, were the ones you were talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. versus Curiosity, which is that one. Right, right, right. Yeah. Opportunity is still there. All three years. Yeah. Okay, so opportunity is still there. Yes, there is still one on Mars. You want to do a mic or something? Oh, sorry. Yes, there is still one on Mars. I think it's Opportunity. Yeah, remember how you said that the program, like, it decides whenever the apple is good or not? Yeah, like, um, how? How does it decide it? It's like a computer. And once you put the program in, like, how does the program work? How, how can it, like, basically decide? <laughs> like, yeah. That's a great question, and you should definitely come in for an internship, number one. <laughs> number two is, um, 
Okay, let me, um, two points. So let's go back to what Uche said, right? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. So what if I have thousands of pictures of moldy fruit, right? What I would do is that I would show the computer thousands of pictures of moldy fruit and thousands of pictures of fresh fruit, right? What would the computer do? Well, it would break down each image and say, ah, oh, the color is this, the color is that. Or this pixel is green, there's maybe mold on it. This pixel is red, it's probably a fresh apple. Or this apple looks shriveled, it's probably moldy. This apple is you know, nice and plump and fresh, it's probably good. What you need to do as the user is that you need to teach the machine how to distinguish one from the other from the data. Right? So you look at each picture of an apple, and you, the human, say, this is fresh or this is moldy. Right? And in, in our field, we call that supervised learning. Right? You, the human, are supervising the machine and teaching the machine how to distinguish a moldy apple from a fresh apple. Right? The way the machine does it is that it takes all this data in, and it tries to find what in the data is specific to a moldy apple or what in the data is suggestive of a fresh apple, right? Now, the trick is why is that so valuable to us? Well, now you, the human, have done your job. You've supervised the machine. The machine has learned, right? Now, if I come in with a picture of an apple the machine has never seen, right, it's able to look at that picture and tell you if it's likely to be a fresh apple or a moldy apple, right? That's why machine learning is so valuable. If it has learned something important from the data, it's able to take that and generalize it, right? Um, let's go back to the other example just for completeness. So what about your experience of putting your hand on a hot stove, right? And learning that, oh, damn, that's painful. I'd better not do it ever again, right? Well, you can't really teach a machine based on that one example, right? The way our brains do it is that they encode that memory so powerfully that that becomes a piece of knowledge that we carry with us for the rest of our lives, right? But now what I can do is tell Nicole and Shreya and Ucha and, and uh, Laura is please don't put your hand on a hot stove, right? If they're a machine, I'll tell the machine the same thing. The way I do it is that I do it with symbols because machines like symbols, right? That's why it's called symbolic AI. I'll teach the machine that putting your hand on a hot stove is bad, right? And the machine is able to use that information and hopefully avoid touching a hot stove ever, right? From that one piece of instruction. So that's how we combine the best of both worlds and try to solve very complicated problems with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, another, um, so you basically have to know coding, right? For the, th yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, uh, that's a question. Well, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, so the software engineers need to know a lot of coding, which might be a little uh, obvious to you. Data scientists use coding as kind of a, a means to an end. So we not all data, some and data scientists have ranging experience within coding. So some might know more languages than others. But for the most part, data scientists are using coding as a means to an end. So we can use it to implement our models and uh, look through the data and gather insights. Um, but we're not, we're not making production code. So we kind of take our results and our uh, hackish code and send it to the software engineers that kind of take those results from our models and make it into prettier code, if you will. Some data scientists are much better coders. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> I'll pass it on to the software engineers. Just curious, how many of you here actually know how to program? Ooh. Wow. Right. Wow, nice. Way more than when I was in your class, or your, uh, your age. Wow. I didn't expect that. Okay, well, yeah. Can I just, okay. I'm going to hijack this question to add on a little bit at the end there. You asked uh, if you need to know coding. And like our lovely data scientists have said earlier, there, to an extent, yeah. Like if you want to work in AI, though, you don't necessarily need to code to just work in the industry. I don't code. 
Yeah, Diane doesn't code. code. There's so many mm -hmm. different things that you can do if you don't want to code in your life, but you still want to interact with some cool like artificial intelligence. You want to go to the future. Yeah. For like for example, for front end, I code half of my job is coding and half of my job is creativity because I have to design stuff to look nice for the user, but I also have to be able to interact with the back end. I feel like back end and the back end like, correct me if I'm wrong, Uche, but combines a lot of different kinds of coding. So you'll have a different, uh, a whole set of different languages that you'll need to know in order to operate on the back end. Mm -hmm. And then moving on to the data scientists, they don't know how to code, but there's a lot of nifty stuff that. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. They do know how to. They do know how to code, math. but they know how to do way much more as well. Heavy, heavy, heavy math. And math. There's a lot of math. I don't know if you guys uh, realize that, but there's a lot of math involved. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. All right, we got a question here in the front. Do you know Python? <laughs> Hell yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I would say you might be hearing the word algorithm all throughout the conversation, right? Which is just like a series of steps or logic or math or anything. So say you're given a problem and you want to find a solution to it. You can stay language agnostic to find the solution but then you will have to finally implement it in some language or the other. And right now I would say the best way to interact with data scientists is through Python, since most of their data science stuff is in Python. However, you can feel free to use any object-oriented language or functional language that you want to. But yes, we do use Python <laughs> to answer your question. I would also like to add that as software engineers, as programmers in general, the languages that are used throughout the industry will change from year to year, from project to project. It's not so important that you know Python specifically, or you know Scala specifically, or you know Ruby specifically. The important thing is that you know how to break down a problem into a series of simple steps, an algorithm that a computer can understand. And that part is, that happens regardless of the programming language you use. Um, do people program computers from other computers? And if so, how is the first one programmed? Oh, wow. Uh, then basically, how are they bootstrap programming? Okay, uh, you are asking about bootstrapping. That's kind of a deep subject for today. <laughs> Nevertheless, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah, an internship would be great. So originally, what computers actually understand, underneath the hood, computers don't understand a single programming language. They don't. Computers are too dumb for that. What computers understand is machine code, which is a series of numbers that you enter with the computer and they represent instructions. The first programming languages weren't programming languages at all. It was people. A lot of them were women, and a lot of them by hand wrote instructions for computers. In fact, the job of these people was called computer. They were people who fed data into computers to make the computers go. Later on, people started developing some simple programming languages to make having to remember all the numbers, the machine instructions, easier. Those became assembly languages. And people used the assembly languages to write other programming languages that made these operations easier. And we've been building up generation after generation from machine language to assembly to low-level programming languages, high-level programming languages, object-oriented, functional programming languages, data-driven, test-driven, and so on and so forth, and languages are still evolving. Basically, to answer your question, make a long story short, it was people who wrote the first machine instructions and eventually, yeah. How is AI going to change education? Not easily. <laughs> That's a really deep question. I don't know. All right, yes. Oh, man.
All right, so one of the things that AI is, that we can expect for AI is for our students to be able to look at statistical models and different things that they might not be able to see in their world. So for example, at Roosevelt this year, uh, we'll be incorporating both AI and VR. Um, um, and mostly AI will happen through augmented reality, not just artificial intelligence, but we'll be able to, for example, if we're talking about sharks, uh, we'll take an iPad out and we will place it on a QR code and then a shark will appear in front of us so that artificial intelligence will be able to recognize where it is as an overlay over the top and then students would be able to circle around and see the shark from all angles as it sits right in front of them. So if you're a student at Roosevelt, you can expect that later this year we're just finalizing all the projects for that to come in and that'll be happening in your science and history classes this year. So there you go, there's a, a, a really easy example. What if the Mars rover um, breaks up on Mars, and uh, how will you fix it? <laughs> okay, uh, once again, we didn't send the Mars rover to Mars. Honest to goodness, we didn't. I, yes, uh, some of our software may have ended up on the rover, but we, we don't have repairmen that we send to Mars. <laughs> there is when the Mars rover was first landing. I'm talking, of course, about the Curiosity rover in 2012. There was a period of time called the Seven Minutes of Terror when a retro rocket booster was slowly lowering the rover to the planet Mars by means of a sky crane. Amazingly, all of that worked, and so the rover is on the red planet. The next rover that we send to Mars for the Mars 2020 mission, I believe, will also be using a sky crane. If the sky crane breaks, and the rover falls, back to the drawing board. So let's try not to make that happen. Like you guys said, you would describe a moldy apple as green. So let's say there's a fresh apple with a green background. How would the computer know what's the background and what's the apple? Ooh. Ooh. That's a good question. That's, that's a great question. So. Uh, what you refer to is how a data scientist spends 80 to 90 percent of his or her time, which is to make sure the data we feed the machine is good data, right? We have a saying that is garbage in, garbage out, right? If you just give the computer a bunch of noise, it'll probably respond back with a bunch of noise. Right? So you made a very specific example of what we refer to informally as cleaning your data. Right? We need to be able to give the computer data that is standardized enough that it won't fool the machine. Right? So we'll either have to tell the machine that don't pay attention to this part of the image, it's background. It's not relevant to the task you're trying to solve. Right? Pay attention to the parts of the data that really matter. Right? Identify where the apple is extract that from the image. The background is noise, it doesn't matter, right? My focus is on the apple, so that's how we do it. But it's really a big, big part of what we do, is make sure the data is good enough to teach the machine what it's supposed to learn. What symbols do you teach the robots? What symbols do we teach the robots? Oh, well, I, uh, the short answer would be, again, going back to the example that Ucha just made, uh, the computer likes instructions, right? We humans usually give instructions to one another using language, right? If I'll tell you, oh, don't put, the, no, don't put your hand on the stove, it's hot, you'll understand me and you'll you know, avoid it. What we need to do in order to give the computer the same piece of knowledge is turn that into symbols, right? So the complicated answer is that we need to come up with a way for the computer to take that language, right? That piece of language, that sentence, and extract meaningful bits from it, right? Now, I won't go into details, but the idea is that we turn that into symbols, right? 
pieces of information that are easily digestible from a computer, but that hold the same value in terms of the information and the knowledge they represent. Right? So the reason it's called symbolic artificial intelligence is because we're translating our language, our knowledge, our understanding of the problem into little symbols that combined together hold the same knowledge power as the way we talk to each other. Here in the middle. Uh, what made you want to start this, like, your job? Which job? Yeah. Well, I can start. Um, as I said, as I said, and I'll give you the, the short answer because I can blather away for half an hour. Um, the way I got started in this particular job is. Um, I had a fascination for how we humans make decisions, right? We're constantly bombarded with a lot of information. There's so much stuff going on. Our brains are constantly digesting data. How do we make decisions? Is the brain essentially an amazing algorithm that can process all this data, rely on previous knowledge and experience, and make a decision, right? Um, that is... Uh, the essence of why I like data science, right? It's not because we're solving one problem one day and a different problem the next day, right? It's because what is common amongst all these problems is that what we really want to do is help people make better decisions. And that's essentially what, what drove me to, to this career. Yeah, so I have a very similar to answer to Giovanni, but really, I'm like I said before, I'm pretty new to the field. So I was uh, in chemical engineering, which is a very quantitative field as well, and I was working in the lab doing a lot of experiments on batteries where I would collect a huge amount of data. And I was exposed to data science, as a, again, as a way to look at that data in a new light. And so I took a training program when I was in grad school. I didn't know any Python about two years ago. I hardly coded ever. But I took this training program, and I just really enjoyed doing data science and building these machine learning models. And I just thought it was very cool that you could train a computer to do something. I was specifically attracted to machine learning. You could train a computer to do something without giving it explicit rules or um, giving it an understanding of the problem. You just throw a bunch of data at it. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so it turns out I don't enjoy doing lab work as much, and I got my master's and became a data scientist. OK, and I don't know if my answer is going to sound silly or smart, but I'll just keep it candid. So as a kid, um, I, like my mom used to work for a bank. So as a kid, I always wanted her to be back home by 4 PM and spend maximum time with me. But being in a bank, and she was all about manual work. Like somebody comes in with a check, she has to add that entry manually. Somebody takes cash out, she has to add that manually. That would take like hours and hours of work. And she would come home like at 8 PM. And I, was, I used to be super mad. Then one fine day, the bank decided to start using computers. And that's when she started coming home at 4 PM because her work was so much simpler. And I'm like, OK, I want to do this. If it makes life simpler, I want to be a software engineer. So that's how I got the inspiration. Space nut here, serious space nut. When I was a little kid, I would take used toilet paper rolls and old Easter egg shells, you know, cut them in half, put the, one of the caps on top of a toilet paper roll. Now I got my own little toy Saturn V rocket. So fast forward to about eighth grade or so, and I actually take a summer class with an astrophysicist, and I learn how much astrophysicists get paid. Go to plan B, become a software engineer. <laughs> so I've been doing software engineering for decades and eventually I learned about this company. Okay, it's in Glendale, that's pretty close, check. Oh, they work with JPL on a day-to-day -day basis, you say. And I applied immediately. And fortunately, we established some rapport right away and now I am working with not only data scientists, front end and back end engineers, but most importantly, fellow space nuts. Uh, so the reason I got interested in AI is not as nearly as heartwarming. Well, AI is, uh, AI is everywhere. You know, if you use Google Maps or Waze, that's AI. If you use Snapchat, there's AI in there. If you use Instagram, there's AI in there too, believe it or not. But uh, I really got mad because I like playing video games and I keep getting beat by bots. <laughs> 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 uh, 
<laughs> Please don't judge me. Yeah, and I was just like, this is really, ang like, I'm angry now. I want to figure out how these things work. And then, you know, fast forward, here I am. <laughs> So since I started, I will end. Uh, I am not a scientist uh, like these guys. I have a pharmacy degree. I am in sales. I run emerging markets and the Asia Pacific. And I would just say to you guys, stay curious. Mm -hmm. Stay curious, curious, curious. 100%. And you'll gravitate towards AI. Um, think about ethics of AI, but stay curious. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. Having an event like the one we had here today with Beyond Limits AI really inspires our students because it shows them the real world opportunities that exist right here in their own community of Glendale. We are so lucky to have such an amazing team show our students what lies ahead for them and provide them a role model for success in college, career, and in their own lives.